Amanda Waller launches an attack on the entire planet, hoping to rob all superpowered individuals of their ability to fight back. How far will she go to restore humanity as the true power on Earth? Let's find out in our review of Absolute Power number one from DC Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Absolute Power number one from DC Comics. Before we get started, I'm just going to put it out there. I was not looking forward to this event at all. Uh, DC has had a, I'm going to be generous here, a horrendous track record with events over the past 18 months-ish. Everything from Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths to Gang War and pretty much everything in between. It's just been a mess. So here we go with another event. Is it good? Is it great? Well, it's a bit of both and I'll explain in a minute, but let's get to the story and then I'll tell you what's going on in the middle. Absolute power number one begins with a brief prologue, which you've probably seen in the preview material if you've been looking around or paying attention. Superman is trying to stop an armed bank robbery by flying up to the top of the skyscraper where the bank robbers are trying to get away in a helicopter. He pretty much freezes the helicopter, stops it. Not a big deal. This is typical Man of Steel stuff. When one of the bank robbers decides to shoot back, well, of course he should know that the bullets should, will bounce off of Superman, but at this time they don't. They go into his chest and out the back, and Superman has a shocked look on his face and he starts falling to his death because he's been shot. His powers are gone. Then we flash back to the previous day where we catch up with Animal Man and his daughter as they're flying home from a camping trip. They see a commotion in the city park and decide to land to investigate, see if somebody's in trouble, if they need help but they're immediately attacked by the city's citizens with sticks, bricks, stones, whatever happens to be available. What follows is just a montage of news reports where we see that a worldwide wave of panicked humanity is reacting to video footage and news reports that the superpowered individuals of Earth have started to run amok and are killing people left and right. We soon learn that Amanda Waller is using the uber powerful computing power of the Brainiac Queen to transmit fake footage data generated by artificial intelligence that shows all the heroes attacking people across the globe. But it's not really just one video, it's all videos across all platforms and across all news sites. It is a worldwide wave of fake news. Okay, Mark Wade's move here is, I guess, as smart as you can get, but with a little bit of a take back, and I'll explain that. So Amanda Waller generates this worldwide sentiment against superpowered individuals because they're spewing out all these fake news reveals that are generated by AI to show that humans are being slaughtered left and right. It's an interesting way to steer public sentiment. That said, the only way this this particular setup works and the way Amanda Waller is able to pull off what she's trying to pull off, you have to take humanity from a very cynical point of view because it assumes that the average human is incapable of thinking for themselves or believing the evidence in front of their own eyes is true. So for example, if you have one of the heroes that's attacking you know, the Eiffel Tower and killing all the visitors that are around it, and yet the people who are really at the Eiffel Tower say, uh, I'm standing right here and nothing is happening. At some point you have to make that connection. So the story only really works from this point of view if you go from the perspective that people just believe what they see online and they have no cognitive ability whatsoever to say, eh, fake news, I'll believe it when I see it in person or get it from a source I trust. Wade tries to cover that by saying Brainiac Queen is hijacking all news sources to give it a little bit more credibility, but it's a bridge that's a little bit too far to cross. As worldwide panic and sentiment starts to sink in, uh, Sarge Steele is walking along with Amanda Waller at their headquarters in the Hall of Order. He's starting to express concern that Amanda Waller is doing whatever she wants, regardless of what the president thinks or Congress or anyone else. So he's starting to display some sort of misgivings about how far Waller is going and the fact that she's completely unchecked in her goal to remove the effectiveness of superpowered beings from the planet. When the public panic starts to reach a high point, Waller instructs all the news outlets to start initiating phase two, which is release the Amazo robots who are sort of giving the announcement that, okay, the world is in chaos. We are going to restore order. We are here to protect the citizens and to really make it seem like that they're the cavalry riding in to save the day. Amazo robots are specifically designed to counteract all the different heroes in an assortment of ways to essentially eradicate their powers or be able to fight back in any way. 
Batman is monitoring a situation because, of course, he's Batman, and he uses the super secret Justice Law League communication frequency to signal to every leaguer who can hear him that Waller's on the attack, the news is all fake, there's some kind of plan that's going on, and it's some kind of coup, for lack of a better term. And he orders everybody to find a place where they can regroup, strategize, and mount some kind of defense. Unfortunately, and everybody's going to hate this, if you're a Green Arrow fan, Batman's transmission is interrupted by Oliver Queen, who's Green Arrow, if you're not familiar, who tells Batman he's given Amanda Waller all the information about the Justice League and the code to tap into the secret communication line that he's set up. Why? Because Green Arrow announces to the entire Justice League that he agrees with Waller, he's on our side, he's been warning everybody for years that their hubris and their inability to keep themselves in check is going to lead to trouble and now the devil has come for his due. That's basically put Green Arrow on the bad side of everyone else within the Justice League whether you're an auxiliary member or the original set. A little bit of commentary. So putting Amanda Waller at, at the heart of this particular event and done in the way that it's been done is kind of a hard pill to swallow. You have to really suspend some disbelief to see that Amanda Waller could do all the things she's doing completely unchecked without any checks or balances and what have you. Ollie's turn here makes it even harder to swallow. He's always been a bit of a self-righteous jerk, if you want to call it that. Uh, very much on the side of chastising, if you will, or lecturing people about having to do better, uh, being in favor of social justice causes and what have you. This is taken to the extreme. If you didn't really have an affinity for Green Arrow or just kind of on the defense about how you feel about him, this issue will get you to hate Green Arrow. Now, of course, caveat. He could be working undercover. He could be putting up a front to kind of get on the inside so that he can undermine Waller from within. That could absolutely be the case. But if it's not, this pretty much destroys Green Arrow's reputation as a hero going forward. So we'll see what the future holds. But for right now, if you didn't like Green Arrow, you're really going to hate him after this issue. Second phase goes into effect. Amaz Amanda Waller sent out all the Amazo robots to hunt down all the different superpowered individuals. If they are super powered because they have magic or they're magic spellcasters like Zatanna or uh, John Constantine, the robots are sent to wipe their memories to prevent them from remembering how to cast spells. If they are science based, they have some sort of technology like time travel, multiverse hopping, anything that would allow them to get out of this situation and then come back in through a flank, they have been cut off. And Amanda Waller's also made deals with folks like Trigon, as we've seen from previous issues, and also the United Planets to prevent anyone from leaving Earth's uh, orbit or prevent outside forces from coming in to lend aid. Effectively, the he Earth's heroes have been completely cut off. Now we have a scenario where all the heroes are depowered and through the dialogue and the narration from Amanda Waller and also failsafe and the people that are on our side, the removal of the powers, according to them, are permanent. The issue ends with John Kent dragging Superman th down the street after that gunshot wound that caused him to fall to the ground. John has also been robbed of his powers, but he's trying to get Superman to some kind of medical attention before he completely dies. Suddenly, a robotic hand comes out of the blue, grabs John by the scruff of the neck, or actually the top of the head, and drags him away. John passes out when he wakes up a little bit later, and this is sort of the cliffhanger moment of the issue. John wakes up on, on this operating examination table next to Brainiac Queen, and it appears she's trying to somehow turn him into some kind of cybernetic individual. And John has, has lost the sense of feeling and memory of who he is and what he's all about. I have to admit, it's a pretty banger issue. Lots of impact, lots of drama, lots of action. So let's talk about what we liked, and then we'll talk about what we didn't like, because you get some of that too. So what do we like? Wade and Mora are still the unbeatable power team. That's There's no denying at this point. If you put those two together and put them on in any comic, that it immediately raises the quality level. You get action, adventure, excitement, drama. All the things that you're looking for from a quality perspective are packed into this issue. And Wade has this ability to take any story and just kind of grab you and pull you along saying, come on, we're going for a ride. You get, you get the feeling that you're on a roller coaster. And, and if you're going to kick off an event, that's the best way to do it. So what didn't we like about Absolute Power number one? The entire premise, it's the foundation of the event, only works 
if you suspend your disbelief on a couple of key points. First, you have to kind of accept or believe that Amanda Waller has never in her life ever been told no, not through her government leaders, not through the people who oversaw her early in her career, not even from her mother and father, whoever they may have been. It, you just, you can't get to this level of, of just do what you want, whenever you want, whenever you feel like it, in whatever capacity it makes sense, it, it, without some kind of checks and balances. You just have to believe that. And honestly, d despite Wade's best efforts, I don't believe it. At some point, some leader or gangster or somebody has to have said, I'm, I've had enough of that lady and hire an assassin and take her out. I mean, that is just the simplest path where somebody who's been so at odds with everyone around her, you have to imagine that had to have happened on more than one occasion. So for her to kind of get to this point without that have ever happened, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Number two, Amanda Waller has to be an idiot to believe that the United Planets or Trigon or any number of the non-Earth based super powered entities won't turn on her at the turn of a dime as soon as they find out all of Earth's heroes have been taken out. There are so many non-Terran villains that are itching to lay waste to Earth out of revenge or spite or whatever for just for meeting Superman. That has to be the case. Amanda Waller can't honestly be that ignorant to believe that she can just boss Trigon around as an example and think that he's not just going to take advantage of the situation. It doesn't make any sense. It's just dumb. And third thing, uh, Oliver, Oliver Queen has to be I think the phrase we got here is galactically stupid to throw his hat in with Amanda Waller. He has to know she's a villain. He has to know she's killed people. He has to know she's unscrupulous and a liar and ethically, not ethically gray, at this point, completely devoid of ethics. He has to know that. And so for him to throw his lot in with her and say, okay, yeah, I'm on your side because yes, the heroes have been unchecked for a very long time. I've been warning them against that. It doesn't make any sense. So you have these pieces in place that, that have to be believed for you to accept that this scenario could come to pass. And even though Wade does his darndest to pull it off, you just don't get there. The pills are too big to swallow. So I'll give Wade a big A for effort. And of course, Dan Moore's art is mind-blowingly fantastic. Putting this whole thing on Amanda Waller isn't enough. You gotta, there needed to be something more to get you to believe that Waller could put this off. And even though Wade did his very best to kind of make it seem believable, it just doesn't get there. So final thoughts, when we think about Absolute Power number one from DC Comics, you get tons and tons of action, adventure, excitement, drama, all of the, the things that you're looking for from a technical and execution perspective to kick off a big summer event. And this is DC's big summer event because the last few events have been horrendous. So they really need something to change their fortunes here. And as a bonus, Dan Moore's art is just exquisite. I mean, there's there's no better power team together between Mark Wade and Dan Moore that can make a comic read and look this good. That said, the story only works if you choose to believe Amanda Waller can take over the world without anyone lifting a finger to stop her. It's just too big a pill to swallow. It just doesn't work. I mean, it, you can try all you want. It, Amanda Waller just doesn't work for this story. It's, it's too much suspension of disbelief that you need to make it happen. Therefore, I'm going to give absolute power number one from DC Comics a 7.2 out of 10. I think it's a fair score, even though the art is, is amazing and Wade's script is more than anyone could have expected for this kickoff. It's just not enough. It's not enough. Amanda Waller is too overexposed and too ridiculous a central villain to make something this big happen. And you just don't believe it. So what do you think? Are we off base? Am I off base? Let me know, leave a comment down below to tell me how far off base I am or not. And if you like Absolute Power or you just, you just like DC Comics in general, give me a thumbs up, let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining and please stay tuned through the outro for the next review.